coming up. A global problem. A lot of the kids had on shoes that were way too small. With a simple solution. I just thought, there's got to be a better way to do this. One young man tries to change the world. We have never been the same since then. Plus, a brawler fights for his life. I really literally could not breathe. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome, folks, to this edition of the 700 Club. Wendy's here with us, and hello. God bless it's you. It's good to see you. It's been good a while. To see you. It has indeed. Glad to see you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know something, in case you didn't already know it. Whenever government does something, they do it worse than the private sector. It's always because they have all these crazy rules, and they can't violate the rules. Well, there's an organization called the TSA. Transportation Safety Authority, which is totally screwing up the air travel of millions of Americans. The joke was TSA stands for thousands standing around. Well, maybe it does because at this point, the wait time is as much as three hours. Somebody was taking a half an hour flight and they had to have three hours to go through the checkpoint. and. Uh, it just, the reason they say, well, they don't know how to rebalance their personnel because they, they can't shift like the private sector from one airport to another and they can't take advantage of things. Listen, if they get hold of health care, it's ruined. If they get hold of transportation, it's ruined. If they get their hands on the banking system, they're doing everything they can to ruin it. And you turn anything that this government, I mean, this country does to the bureaucrats, and invariably they're going to foul them up. Look what happened to the Veterans Administration. It is a scandal, Wendy. Yeah, Pat, the lines are so bad in some airports that they're sending in the clowns to keep people entertained while they wait. Heather Sells has the story. American Airlines estimates that 4,000 people have missed their flights at O'Hare Airport in Chicago since February, thanks to long wait times. Earlier this week, over 400 people missed getting aboard their plane after waiting hours in the TSA line. Many had to spend the night on airport cots. There's got to be a better way. Both Chicago's major airports, Midway and O'Hare, are telling passengers arrive three hours early before your flight to make sure that you make it. And the TSA chief is apologizing for what happened in Chicago. I don't know what that was. Uh, we're fixing that. That's a great concern to me. We are the busiest aviation uh, city in the country, and there are inadequate resources. And that, what is, uh, what is maddening and frustrating is it was all predictable and could have been dealt with uh, months ago. So what is happening? Across the country, passenger volume is up by as much as 15% this year compared to last, and the number of screeners is down. TSA is rushing 50 new security officers to Chicago in the next few weeks and hoping to hire more than 6,000 new workers just in time for the summer season. At least one Illinois lawmaker is calling on the TSA chief to resign if lines aren't shorter by Memorial Day. Airports in New York and Atlanta are threatening to privatize screening, although they would need TSA approval. Other airports are simply finding ways to relieve passenger stress. They're bringing in musical performances, miniature therapy horses, and even bringing in some clowns to keep passengers entertained during the long, long waits. Heather Sells, CBN News. It's a disgrace. But that's the government, ladies and gentlemen. And if you want more government, just keep an eye on these elections coming up and see which candidates want more government. More government. And I look at what's happened to that banking system. I look at what happened to Sarbanes-Oxley. I look at other laws that have been passed by those who claim to be, quote, progressive. Progressive means we're going to foul up everything you're doing. We need freedom in this country. Like Gulliver and the Lilliputians, Gulliver is the giant, and the Lilliputians got all these um, lines around him. Yes. I found, <clears throat> sorry about my voice, That's but I right. found a way around these long lines in the Atlanta airport. What'd you do? I went over and I got a tip from a guy at the airport. He said, go to the international terminal, there won't be any wait. I had my, even though I had a domestic ticket, sailed right through. 
Well, it was amazing. The international that, that sends you out of the country, doesn't it? Well, no, I still had to take the train back to the domestic terminal, oh. but I <laughs> saved two hours. Dear Lord. Two hours of wait time. Well, Wendy, it's, it, it, to me, it's just appalling they let this happen. And what's happening in, in the Veterans Administration is even worse because people are dying because of this in a bureaucratic inefficiency, and they don't fire people. You know, in the private sector, people either perform their tasks or they don't get a job, and uh, they're able to move faster. What's got to be done quickly is privatize these airports if, if screening is important. But look at what the, the Israelis do. They have people pre-screen the important ones, the ones who really get, make trouble. But some little 75-year-old grandmother is not going to blow up an airplane. Yet she's got to stand there, take her shoes off, and go through all this ritual. It is absolutely insanity. And all it was was a work make a make work project for the supporters of the Obama administration. Well, in other news, Hillary Clinton is a little closer to winning the Democratic nomination, but Bernie Sanders is doing his best to stop her. John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau. That's right, Pat. Clinton and Sanders split the primary votes on Tuesday, with Clinton barely pulling out a victory in Kentucky, while Sanders got the win in Oregon. And the socialist senator from Vermont again claimed he can beat Donald Trump in November's general election. If the Democratic Party wants to be certain that Donald Trump is defeated, and that we must do, we together are the campaign to do that. Despite the split, Clinton is virtually certain to be the Democratic nominee, and polls are showing a very tight race between her and Donald Trump. The people of Venezuela are suffering right now in a country rocked not only with political unrest under a socialist government, but now that unrest has led to permanent shortages of food, basic goods, and medicine. Many Venezuelans are fleeing to the United States and specifically to Orlando, Florida. Churches there are welcoming close to 400 families a month. Pastor Gabriel Salguero is the president of the National Latino Evangelical Coalition. His Orlando church is welcoming several new families every week. And he told CBN News the work is nowhere near being done. I myself went to Maracaibo, Venezuela years ago to meet with the pastors there and to build bridges of relationships. But at the same time, there's a real opportunity to be a gospel presence and to be Jesus to these people. You can hear more Pastor Salguero's interview, including how his church is sponsoring job fairs and providing other resources for immigrants, along with working with churches in Venezuela by going to CBNNews.com. Well, the issue of child sex trafficking is being featured on the big screen in a recently released movie called The Abolitionists. The film follows special ops teams as they go undercover freeing child sex slaves and arresting their traffickers. Abigail Robertson brings us that story. Sex trafficking has become one of the world's largest and fastest growing criminal enterprises with more than two million young victims. It may seem like a hopeless problem to many, but not to Tim Ballard, a man with one mission, end child sex trafficking. This problem is not going away in, with, with the status quo solution. There's just, there's too many victims. There's too much of this evil out there. Ballard began his fight while working for Homeland Security, handling trafficking cases with American victims. Then, after seeing the international scope of this problem, he realized as a private citizen, he could save even more children. In a leap of faith, Ballard started Operation Underground Railroad, a nonprofit comprised of former CIA, Special Ops, and Navy SEALs who are experts in extraction missions. Since they began two years ago, they have rescued 521 victims and arrested 161 human traffickers. When Oscar-winning producer Gerald Mullen heard about what Ballard was doing, he saw a unique opportunity to expose this horrific crime to the world. Jerry Mullen, the, the Oscar winner of Schindler's List, comes to me and he says, he says, Tim, I want to follow you guys around and I want to I wanna make the Schindler's List of our day. But this time, you know, he talked about how this time, he's going to make the movie while we still have time to rescue kids, while we can use the movie to actually rescue kids. That idea came to life as The Abolitionist, a documentary showing three undercover roundups. During the missions, Ballard and his underground jump teams put on hidden cameras and pose as sex tourists. After they have an exchange of money, authorities come in and make the arrests. The beautiful part about that is it allows 
the governments or the police uh, around the world to utilize the film so these kids never have to go testify. And yet the bad guys can be put away. So, she, so she's 14? Yes. Here's the thing, does she do everything? If she wants more money, she better ask. There's not going to be any problems. Exactly. And she's 14 for sure. Yes. Laura. Yes. You're the man. Ballard says the hardest part about being undercover is looking in the kids' eyes and not breaking character. The minute he said, oh, she's 12, I see my daughter, who's 12. And it was so hard, because I just want to reach out and just strangle these guys or cry or fall. And instead, I got to just smile and hug these guys and say, this is what I want, buddy, good job. Aftercare facilities come in immediately to comfort and support the children after the rescue. The children see their undercover rescuers arrested with their captors, and in most cases, never learn they actually saved their lives. There's light at the end of this dark, dark tunnel. And with more support and with more people getting involved, that light becomes bigger and bigger and bigger until we snuff this out and get these poor children out of hell. The creators of The Abolitionists hope the movie brings greater awareness to this issue and shows people that there are ways everyone can help fight for this cause. Reporting from Washington, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. Thanks, Abby. No women in a military draft for now, at least. House Republicans have blocked a provision from the annual defense policy bill that would have required women to register for a draft. Democrats call the move an attempt to avoid a contentious vote on equality for women. But Republicans say much more study is required before changing the longstanding prohibition on women in the selective service. Republicans also questioned if the compulsory draft should be replaced with an all-volunteer force. House Rules Committee Chairman Congressman Pete Sessions said he adamantly opposed coercing women to register for a draft. Well, staying active and keeping your schedule full could help keep your mind sharp as you get older. Health Day News reports a study of older adults found that those with heavy schedules tended to do better on tests of memory information, information processing rather, and reasoning. The study doesn't prove being busy makes people smarter, but the leader of the study says it's likely that being busy benefits your thinking abilities. Other studies have found that learning new skills also can help older adults improve their mental abilities. Pat, I'm sure you agree with that study. Well, there's somebody around here that agrees with it because they're working me hard all the time. <laughs> so yes, they are. You're busier than all of us. <laughs> well, I've got, I like to be busy. I've got several jobs, not just one. I've got several of them. It, it does keep me busy. My, my producer was telling me this. You know, these things keep your brain going. I said, yeah, that's why I'm on the phone with you at 730 in the morning <laughs> talking about issues facing the world. Oh, brother. It, it, okay. really, it really does make a difference when yeah, you're active does. and well, you're interested in I'm, I'm things. going all the time. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, coming up, Isra Israeli and Tanzanian doctors working together to save young lives and change perceptions about Israel. I can guarantee you that their image of Israel changed after their child or their children received surgery. I love Israel because he rescued my son's life. Give me five. Yes. He's so good. CBN News goes behind the scenes of this unique partnership when we come back. Well, now for a little bit of good news. So much bad news in the press, isn't it? But this is good news. The tiny nation of Israel has an abundance of world-class doctors and surgeons, and they're using their medical expertise to help others. As Chris Mitchell shows, pediatric heart specialists from Israel travel to East Africa, to Tanzania, to provide life-saving surgeries for desperately ill children. This is Dar al Salaam, Tanzania's largest city. Home to more than 50 million people, this East African country has only one hospital for heart patients. Last year, the Chikaya Kikweti Cardiac Institute at the Muhimbili Hospital saw 25,000 patients and performed 270 surgeries. That's not nearly enough. Help is needed, and the Israeli organization Save a Child's Heart is answering the call by partnering with the Cardiac Institute. Here at the Wolfson Medical Center near Tel Aviv, doctors give their time to save a child's heart. Over the years, they've saved the lives of more than 4,000 babies and children from Asia, Africa, South America, and the Middle East. And there's more. 
for us, just bringing children to Israel, it's nice, it's important, but it's not as good as treating them here at home. Cardiologist Dr. Sagi Asa is one of 35 doctors and other staff who brought their talent and care to Dar es Salaam for a week-long mission. For the healing process of a child, it is as important as the surgery itself. Uh, to be in your environment, treated by your physicians, speaking your language. They perform 12 surgeries, 21 other procedures, and screen 125 children for heart issues. That number included seven-month-old Whitney. She needed surgery to separate the blood vessels to her heart. CBN News received a rare opportunity to document the surgery performed by the team of Israeli and Tanzania doctors. And if not treated at the first year of life, that might be irreversible. And this patient would grow up and die miserably at the age of about 20 or so. Whitney's mom, Lydia, said she knew her daughter's case was uncommon. I was very scared and then I asked, have you ever did an operation like that to the other kids apart from this? They said no, but at Islay we used to do it. So they are going to be successful. And uh, that means that she would be able to live like a normal life expectancy, have children, uh, uh, be like a normal child. But the work of Save a Child's Heart doesn't stop there. It's not the volume which counts here, it's that capacity building. And that's why you see the operations are complicated, but it's the locals who are doing with the supervision from the Israel team. Professor Mohammed Janabi, director of the Cardiac Institute, knows it's an uphill task. Because these operations, by our own, nobody could have tried to touch those kids. Having him coming here and for the first time, uh, we did it together here. So that, uh, well, I'm hoping that uh, the next case I'll be able to do it by myself. Dr. Godwin Godfrey trained in Israel for five years. That helped prepare him for a busy schedule when he returned to Tanzania. I'm the only one who specializes in pediatric cardiac surgery department, but I have some help from uh, other cardiac surgeons who specialize like in adults and uh, vascular. Head surgeon of Save a Child's Heart, Dr. Lior Sasson mentored Godfrey. I'm very proud because uh, now he assisted me, but in many other cases he did it uh, by himself. What we're looking at is, is the fruits and the results of a long training program in Israel, where Israeli doctors have been training their colleagues from Tanzania. Save a Child's Heart executive director Simon Fisher said, there's been a dramatic improvement in the complexity of the cases that Godfrey can handle. Missions like these, he said, bring the Tanzania team closer to becoming independent. Until a year ago, Tanzanian children in need of heart surgery could not be treated inland. Um, the only opportunities were through surgery either in India um, or in Israel. This partnership is also giving both Israel and Tanzania an opportunity to take on negative perceptions. If you go out today and interview people, what do you know about Israel? So oh, they are the people who are shooting the Palestinians. No, 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 they are in Mwembili trying to do operation. If you interview 10 people today, trust me, maybe one will believe your story. And it's the same thing that uh, many people come to Africa, they don't think if they'll find cars, roads and everything. They always think about they'll find people starving and living in the jungles and what. So it's really about the image that is portrayed. Randy Weiss recruits volunteers and spends a lot of time keeping the children happy. She hopes the good work done here and other places will help get the word out not only about this organization, but Israel as well. There's so much negativity associated with Israel and especially any kind of news that comes out of Israel. Um, and people tend to ignore all these wonderful things. Missions like these can help tip the scales. I can guarantee you that their image of Israel changed after their child or their children received, uh, received surgery. Such was the case for this Muslim dad. I love Israel because he risked my son's life. Give me five. Yes, he's so good. And that says it all. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Alon Israel, with reporting from Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Well, this is what the Bible says, that to Abraham, your seed, shall all the world be blessed. And I believe the Israelis are fulfilling that. 
They're blessing the world with technology. They're blessing the world with uh, a message of freedom that was in the Bible. They're blessing the world with medical technology. And, uh, uh, you know, it's high time the United Nations and others recognize what a great country this is. Wendy? Well, coming up, a young man on a missions trip makes a sad discovery. Right next to me was a little girl in a white dress. And as I looked down, I was absolutely shocked at how small her shoes were. It just really bugged me. And I looked around and a lot of the kids had on shoes that were way too small. Hear how this Regent student was inspired to create the shoe that grows and see how his idea went viral. But first, we're gonna bring it on. Rita says, with the upcoming Olympics, I always look forward to seeing the equestrians. When it comes to dressage, I notice some riders wear spurs. Does this hurt the horse? We'll get Pat's expert answer on dressage right after this. Well, it's time to bring it on with your questions, and Pat is in the hot seat. Let's start with Rita's question. She says, with the upcoming Olympics, I always look forward to seeing the equestrians. When it comes to dressage, I notice some riders wear spurs. Does this hurt the horse? And why do some horses foam at the mouth? Are they in distress? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, uh, some trainers actually get uh, shaving soap and put in their horse's mouth because it, when a horse is on the bit, <clears throat> something underneath here, uh, you know, it gets more active and they have saliva and the saliva shows that the horse is on the bed. And so a little bit of foam at the mouth is, I was just say they, they spray them with uh, shaving soap to get, to get that effect. Honest. Is that good for the horse? Oh, who cares? I mean, yeah. a little bit of shaving soap at the edge oh. of your mouth. I mean, I, I put shaving soap at the end <laughs> of my mouth, but it doesn't hurt anything. <laughs> but uh, people are concerned about uh, spurs and uh, they dressage, they use the so-called Prince of Wales spurs, which is just a, uh, a very, uh, they, there's a dressage move with my horse. You see, I'm not hurting him any. But uh, he, he, he's, this is a, uh, well, that's a passage <coughs> he's doing right now. But. Uh, <clears throat> and you have your spurs on. Yeah, but you just barely touch him. And that little yeah. touch, a sensitive horse, it, it uh, uh, you know. But they're more, it's more fun to ride them when they, they, but they get collected and you have to get them. I mean, all those moves, it, it, it's just a little, a little more sensitive. But they use the, the Prince of Wales Spurs <clears throat> is a nub about as big as my little finger. Mm -hmm. And it's blunt and it just, it's a little extra touch the horse feels. Mm -hmm. Nobody's beating up horses. Good. All right. Well, All right. Ed says, I'm trying to learn and understand scripture. I heard a preacher say that when sinners are judged, that Christians will witness this judgment. So we will see loved ones that are not saved, sentenced to hell, and some Christians will know that they didn't try to get them saved. For this, there will be much pain and crying by the ones that are saved. Then the Bible says, God will wipe away their tears. Is any of this true or have I heard it all wrong? That guy, I wonder where these preachers come from. There's so much lack of knowledge. Uh, the Bible says God will wipe away all the tears from your eyes, but the tears have to do with the sorrow you've had, the loss of loved ones, and the suffering and pain that uh, people have gone through in this world. But uh, no, I don't know anything in the Bible that says that we're going to sit around watching your loved ones getting thrown into hell. That's horrible even to contemplate. Yeah, that's nothing not in the, in the Bible. Nothing in the Bible. Not in no the Bible. way. All right, this viewer says, Dear Pat, I'm a Christian, but I like Jewish music. I know all forms of godly music is inspired by people to praise God. I don't know much about Judaism, but I enjoy the music, even though I don't really understand the words. I enjoy the passion behind the lyrics. Is it okay for me to listen to this music <laughs> when I don't understand it? <laughs> Boy, where do we get all these rules? Is it okay to listen to music? Yeah. <laughs> I, I think Jewish music is wonderful. And, you know, they dance the whole run and they, 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 they clap and they sing. I mean, you know, the Bible says, then shall the maidens rejoice in the dance. I mean, there's this idea of dancing and singing and tambourines. That's all biblical. Well, and there's a lot of messianic Jewish praise music oh. that is 
very great. That's you know, Paul Wilbur. Yeah. If you like Jewish praise music, Paul Wilbur is the well, place to go. We've had him at, uh, every time we do the Feast of Tabernacles, but yeah. of course, it's wonderful music. All right. John says, you've talked on the 700 Club about the dangers of high fructose corn syrup many times. My question is, is eating other forms of corn products harmful? Actually not. Um, if you, if you uh, uh, eat uh, corn and soybeans, you have a perfect protein with about uh, 24 uh, of the molecules of a complete amino acid. And I, I think, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, Mexicans and others in South America have corn tortillas, and uh, the corn is very healthy, uh, especially when it's mixed with beans. Um, frijoles and uh, tortillas, very good. So they have the combination. You've got corn, tamales or tortillas, and uh, you've got frijoles. And the beans and the corn make a perfect protein. And so it's good nutrition. Making me hungry. I think. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right. Joy says, when Jesus turned water into wine, was it alcoholic? Uh, the best I can gather it is, you know, the, the master of the feast said, uh, you know, a lot of people, they take the rot gut and they wait till people get uh, all drunk and then they serve that. But you've kept the best to last. So you don't describe grape juice that way. So, yes, it was, it was alcoholic. All right. Paul says, how do I ask for healing power? I pray, but I don't know if it changes things. Uh, you know, I, I don't know what you're doing, so I, I can't comment. I don't know what's in your heart or what's in the situation that you're dealing with. But the Bible uh, indicates you transmit power through the spoken word. You speak to the disease. You speak to the demon. You speak to the condition and command it in Jesus' name. And I think it's rather than saying, oh, God, heal this person, Oh, God, heal this person, and now give me the word to speak in the name of Jesus, be healed. All right? That's good. Helen says, Hi, Pat. I've heard that the spirit leaves our bodies when we die and that it can linger on earth for three days. Is there any biblical teaching to support this? Well, that, that was a Jewish tradition. And when you look at uh, Jesus at the tomb of Lazarus, he, he waited about four days until Lazarus was good and dead. Right. And so that was the idea <clears throat> that... Uh, uh, according to the Jewish tradition, he was hanging around for three days and then had left. So when Jesus did the miracle, it was an uh, extraordinary miracle. He brought Lazarus back into his body. Um, the Bible doesn't expressly teach that. If it does, I don't know where, it, where that, that's to be found. I don't know where it is. But that, that was the instance where it, it was demonstrated rather than taught. Yeah. All right. Well... Thank well, you. I was just going to say thanks for your great questions and, as always, great wisdom from well, Pat. You're very sweet. Well, one person can really change the world. Just ask uh, Kenton Lee, this Regent University graduate. I'm so proud of them and him. This man saw a need, and he came up with an idea that's improving the lives of children in 40 countries around the world. When Kenton Lee went on a mission trip to orphanages in Ecuador and Kenya, he saw the struggles those children face every day. But out of the many needs they had, one grabbed his attention. I remember that right next to me was a little girl in a white dress. And as I looked down, I was absolutely shocked at how small her shoes were. It just really bugged me. And I looked around and a lot of the kids had on shoes that were way too small. Kenton learned how dangerous it is for children in developing countries who either don't have shoes that fit properly or have no shoes at all. They're walking around and they're getting cuts and scrapes and burns, and now their feet are open, and these parasites and these diseases enter their body through their feet. I just thought, there's got to be a better way to do this. When Kenton returned to the U.S., he decided to start a nonprofit organization to help these kids, but wasn't sure how to make it happen. So he enrolled in Regent University's master's program in organizational leadership. I wanted to learn more about leadership. I wanted to learn more about organizations and how they function. And so this was a great one-year program that I could, uh, could do online and be flexible with my life. While taking the online program, he came up with an idea to solve the orphan's problem. On a piece of paper, he sketched out a design for a shoe that would grow with a child's foot. 
After months of rejections and closed doors, he found a design company in Portland, Oregon that loved his idea and brought it to life. I still remember getting the box in the mail that had the final prototype and thinking, this has been so much work and so much energy and so many prayers. I remember opening it up and looking at it and holding it and moving the, the snaps, everything, and just being thrilled. He called it the shoe that grows. It can grow in three main places. It grows in the front with this post and these holes. It grows on each side with heavy duty snaps and then it grows on the back with our buckle. By now, Kenton had finished his Regent Masters and established his nonprofit organization, Because International. After a promotional video of the shoe that grows went viral, money came in and they were able to ship 35,000 pairs to kids in 40 countries. We had so much support and donations and interest and media attention. Things just took off in April of last year and it turned our organization upside down, turned my life upside down, um, and uh, we have never been the same since then. Today, Kenton's organization is still growing. I really felt like God put something in front of me and then it was up to me to, to say yes, to pursue it and to go after it. He says going to Regent University empowered him to follow God's plan for his life and make children's lives a little better. Without that year with the master's program at Regent, I don't know if the shoe that grows would be here today. It was such a big part of my life and our work. Uh, it really helped to change my life. Now, isn't that wonderful? We've got over 20,000 graduates like him out there in the world right now from Regent. And, you know, right at this point, Regent is offering uh, a uh, hundred, a hundred degree programs, nearly a hundred uh, programs and concentrations. And uh, it was named one of the top 10 best online schools for veterans by military times. So not only for people who are not veterans or who are not in the service, but for everybody. And I might add, well, I, I better ahead and say what I was going to say because it sounds like I'm bragging. <laughs> I <don't laughs> Really? <laughs> so I, I'll keep that. If it's true, I'll keep it's not that, <laughs> But it's a great school. And uh, I'm excited to see the fact that they're, they're coming up. Well, just thousands of people coming to school there online and, and uh, on campus. The number is 1-866-910-7618. I don't know why they didn't get an easier number to remember, but anyhow, 866 <laughs> 8669107618 is on your screen and uh, you can log on to www.regent.edu and get information <clears throat> whatever you need and they told me they're working so hard when somebody calls in they're supposed to get an answer in 30 seconds wow that's good they moved it down from two minutes to one minute to mm. 30 seconds that's so uh, you talk about on if TSA would come and, <laughs> and look at the enrollment system at Regent, they'd have those lines shortened in a heartbeat. All right. I Wendy. still can't believe they've got clowns in the airport. Can you? <laughs> clowns <laughs> scare me anyway. That would make it worse for me. I, I'm hurrying to get to another destination. <laughs> they show me a clown. I mean, it's just a joke, isn't it? Okay. It really is. What's next? Coming up later, a military family struggles to make ends meet. Just more bills that just stack up higher and higher. And um, you know, it's tough to already pay the bills that I have now. See how this family receives a hand up from people like you. Welcome back to Washington for the CBN News Break. The South Carolina legislature has passed a bill that forbids abortions after 19 weeks. Under the measure, any doctor who performs an abortion after 19 weeks would face up to three years in prison and a $10,000 fine. The measure has exceptions if the mother's life is in jeopardy or if the baby won't survive outside the womb. The legislation now heads to Governor Nikki Haley, who said she will almost certainly sign it into law. A bill giving the families of 9-11 victims the right to sue Saudi Arabia is moving forward despite pressure from the Saudis and resistance from the Obama administration. The Senate passed the bill Tuesday and now it moves to the House. 
If passed, the legislation would allow families to sue the Saudi government in U.S. courts for any role it might have played in the 2001 terror attacks. Classified intelligence material allegedly discusses the kingdom's possible involvement. But Saudi leaders are threatening to pull billions of dollars from the U.S. economy if the bill passes. And the Obama administration says the legislation could put Americans living overseas at risk. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Wendy will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. While her husband serves in the Army overseas, Natalie takes care of the family alone. Two of their children need special medical care, and the bills have been piling up. So we decided to give this hardworking couple some extra help. Sergeant Rubin is proud to serve in the United States Army, but admits it's hard leaving his wife Natalie and his children behind when deployed overseas. It's a sacrifice that comes with serving his country. It makes me proud every day. It just reminds me what he is, a soldier protecting our country. Home life is challenging for Natalie because daughter Ariel has a heart defect requiring extra care. Their son Jaden has autism causing him to run away. With Jaden and his autism, it's, it's definitely hard taking him somewhere because he'll just take off and run and, and it's hard for me with two other kids to chase after him. The kids get very little outdoor playtime. They couldn't buy a swing set for their fenced-in yard because money was tight. They had medical bills and the boys needed dressers. Going into debt to buy the swing set wasn't an option. It's just more bills that just stack up higher and higher, and I'm, you know, it's tough to already pay the bills that I have now. The couple attends a military support group near Fort Campbell called Force Ministries. Force asked CBN's Helping the Home Front to help, and we said yes. Director Greg Wark told the couple CBN was buying the boys' furniture and providing $1,000 to cover medical expenses. Now, does that relieve a little bit of stress? Yeah. So much stress. Not that little, <laughs> it doesn't stop there. They're going to buy you an entire play set and have it put up in your yard, all assembled so that your son will have his own wonderful place to play. It's awesome. And we want you to know that it's our prayer that God would alleviate some of the pressure that's on you and give you the ability to take a breath. Thank you very much. Within a few weeks, the furniture was delivered and the kids' playset installed. <laughs> Reuben knows that the next time he deploys, there's a lot less stress on Natalie and the children. I'm very thankful for uh, CBN and helping the home front that there's something out there for soldiers and, and veterans and that you could definitely use the help and, and take that weight off their shoulders. I just love seeing that and seeing those tears of joy. Well, if you're a member of the 700 Club, then you made that happen. And when you join, if you, if you haven't joined, uh, please ask for Pledge Express when you do. This is our gift to you. When you do, it's a monthly teaching by Pat and Gordon. It's fantastic. Now, if you'd like to designate your gift to Helping the Home Front, you can do that as well. Just dial the number on your screen, or you can mail your gift to CBN, Helping the Home Front, Virginia Beach, Virginia, 23463. Well, up next, a man who was a slave to drugs for decades. I didn't like the fact that I was hooked. I didn't like the fact that something was controlling me any more than I liked people controlling me. Five rehabs didn't help. The two psychiatric institutions didn't help. Stay tuned to see what finally freed this man from the stranglehold of addiction. To see this week's most viewed stories, go to CBN.com. Jim Harris was a rebel without a cause from the get-go. Even as a child, he despised any authority figure. Jim's attitude grew worse as he got older. But the irony is, Jim ended up a slave to the worst master of all, crack cocaine. From a young age, Jim Harris had a rebellious streak and took no guff from anyone. I got into quite a lot of fights. I was told basically as a kid by my dad, it would be better for me to go ahead and 
to get in that fight than to run from that fight. I had no tolerance for anybody to want to pick on me or, you know, say something to me I didn't like. He also had issues with authority figures. I hated anybody to tell me what to do. It was definitely a problem, that uh, rebellious nature. Several people in Jim's family, including his grandmother, were Christians, but he thought they were all phonies. I grew up hearing about Christ. I thought that Christians were squares and hypocrites and you know other things that you know I didn't like, didn't want anything to do with. Jim smoked pot for the first time when he was 12, when an older friend told him it would be cool. This continued throughout high school. Drugs, they're a lot of fun. I mean, they make you feel good. They uh, enhance things, put you around a lot of other people that like to party and have a good time. Now, when you start to try to get off of them, that's when you realize that they've got hooks in you. Jim joined the Navy after graduation, but received a medical discharge when he was injured not long after enlisting. He returned to Texas, but with no skills, no job prospects, and no purpose in life, Jim turned to drugs again, working his way up to meth and heroin. He began dealing, and soon it was consuming his life. I was a smart junkie. I knew I was going to overdose, so I did things to prevent and to enhance and be able to get higher. Several stints in jail and rehab didn't help Jim. During those stays, you would get off the drugs, but they had a, a really, really strong hold. So when you get back out on the street, there they were again, because you were landing right in the same spots that uh, you came out of. I didn't like the fact that I was hooked. I didn't like the fact that something was controlling me any more than I liked people controlling me. The uh, five rehabs didn't help. The two psychiatric institutions didn't help. One evening, Jim and his girlfriend, Frida, invited some friends over for a party, one that had an unexpected ending. We partied and had a really good time for, I don't have no idea how long. And I really literally for a little bit could not breathe. I called 911 and the police showed up. And looking around the house, they could tell that, you know, I was messed up and this was a drug situation. They stabilized me, they arrested me. Jim had a seizure and later coded at the hospital. When he came to, he knew he would be facing jail time. He pulled his IVs out and ran from the hospital, but was eventually arrested on numerous counts of possession. The incident caused Frida to turn back to the faith of her childhood, and Frida later helped Jim get into the God Pod at the Tarrant County Jail where he befriended a chaplain. His name's Roger Holler, and I had been watching and listening to him talk about his family and his kids and his military experience and the things that he was involved in and interested in, and he was real. Over time, Jim became good friends with Roger and grew to respect him. One evening, he was preaching a sermon at the prison and asked if anyone wanted to accept Christ. I said yes, and I prayed the prayer of salvation and a bunch of the other guys gathered around me and uh, they laid hands on me and prayed for me. It was like I blushed from the top of my head all the way down to the bottoms of my feet and it was a sustained heat. I can't really explain it and I'd have compared it to uh, a gallon of hot 40 weight being poured over you and flowing all over your body. But while this is happening, this just incredible peace enveloped me and I knew something had changed. After that encounter, Jim started studying the Bible and says God began to change his heart. The realization that I was the problem came to me in an instant. That's the moment where I became able to change my mind about things of the world and start looking at things of God, which is repentance. As Jim served out his time, he says with God's strength, he overcame his addictions. I've never had a craving for the cocaine or the heroin or the methamphetamines again. The word says that he that lives within you is stronger than he that lives in the world. And it also says that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. And I stand on those types of promises because I believe that's what set me completely free. After Jim was released, he and Frieda married. He turned his interest in radio-controlled aircrafts into a ministry called Fly Right Ministries. Today, he travels to prisons throughout Mississippi and Alabama, spreading the good news of the gospel. 
I impact people that I don't know because God lives in me. And people notice, especially when you're out with a microphone in your hand, telling them how good God really is and how bad I really was and what a difference He's really made. It's not just a story. It's not a fairy tale. It's real. He said it right. It's real. What happens when somebody says yes to Jesus? He was hooked on crack. It's very, very hard to get somebody off of crack cocaine. It is one of the most devastating addictions that's known to man. And yet he was delivered in an instant. And he felt something just like hot oil going over his body when he made that decision. What is it? You see, God is real. And he is all powerful. And he comes upon people and sets them free. This isn't just make believe and it isn't something you quote do at church. This is reality in the life of every human being. The God who made you wants you home. He wants you to be part of heaven. He wants you in his heavenly kingdom. He wants you there for all eternity. The Bible says, I hasn't seen nor ear heard the things that God has prepared for them that love him. I offer you right now eternity, joy, peace, and love. And I'm going to ask if you want to receive the Lord. This isn't playtime. I'm talking about the greatest reality of all. And when you make this transaction, it'll change your life. So bow your head right now if you want to be set free. If you want to know joy and peace, pray this prayer with me. Jesus, that's right, pray with me. Jesus, I know that you died for my sins. And I know that you rose again, that I might have everlasting life. And so right now, Jesus, <clears throat> I come to you with my failing. You know the things that have enslaved me. You know the trials and the tribulations. But I bring them all to you now, Lord. And I ask in the name of Jesus that you will come into my heart Live in me, and from this moment on, I am yours. Thank you, Lord. Now, I want to pray for you, Father, in Jesus' name. For everyone who prayed just then, I ask for the power of the Holy Spirit to touch them. In Jesus' name, touch. Amen. If you prayed with me, <clears throat> I want to give you something. I've been offering this for some time, but it's very important. It'll tell you what to do next. It's the CD in here. 90, uh, 70 minutes of concentrated teaching, and it's called A New Day. I'll give this to you free, but I want you to call right now, if you would, please, and say, I prayed with Pat. I gave my heart to the Lord. Telephone number is on your screen. It's a toll-free number, 1-800-759-0700. Well, we leave you with today's Power Minute from Romans 10. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The angels of heaven are rejoicing over you who have come to the Lord. God bless you. For Wendy and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.